Well, now it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce um, Dr. Robert Lewis. He was the founding pastor of Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Even more importantly, he was the founder of Men's Fraternity, which there are now 20,000 chapters of Men's Fraternity around the world. Uh, he's the author of the books The Modern Day Night and The Church of Irresistible Influence. Uh, he's here with his lovely wife, Sherrod, whose grandfather was actually Dr. Thompson, the pastor of our church from 1922 to 1930. How great is that, that the grandson-in-law would be back. Sometimes it works, this passing along of faith. Uh, most importantly, he has a passion for God's Word and for his people. Would you welcome Dr. Lewis? Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Well, good morning, church. Everybody doing well today? Good. I am delighted to be here, really thrilled to be here, as Garrett already mentioned, because there's such um, a historical and spiritual connection between my wife and I and you already. And uh, that is because, uh, as he mentioned, um, Sherrod's grandfather pastored this church from 1922 to 1930. Uh, even more specifically, he was the one who led the charge and raised the money to move you from the old site where First Presbyterian was to this site. And his plaque and the building committee and everything is just right out in the foyer. But he built this worship center. And I just thought, man, what a thrill to be here today, 84 years after he preached on this stage, and have the special opportunity and honor of being able to share the Word of God with you. Isn't that great? Uh, also, he had an incredible impact on my own life, uh, besides the fact that he married Sherrod and I. Uh, when I was a young guy, just to become a Christian, didn't really grow up as a Christian, confused, but I thought I wanted to go into the ministry, and I remember going over to his house when he was quite aged and walked in and talked to him about seminary and school and that kind of thing. He was very gentle and kind and interacted with me. And I remember he walked me to the door and uh, right before I walked out the door, he just put his hand on my shoulder, kind of like a priestly blessing, and looked at me and said, Listen, Robert, you just go to a place, a school, where they teach the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God, and you're going to be okay. He died a short time right after that. Those were his last words to me. Just go where they teach the Bible is the Word of God, and you'll be okay. And so I'm excited to be here because of the fact of the spiritual blessing of one of your patriarchs. And uh, so this is a delight to be here today. Hey, my question for today is simple. It's in your outline. What is a man? Pretty basic, I know. And this is going to be a fairly simple, but I hope very practical message. What is a man, a real man? And uh, that's a good question for us guys. But because you women have to deal with us guys, I think it's going to be a good message for you uh, as well. So let me just go right into it. What is a man? What is a man? You would think after thousands of years of civilization, we'd be able to answer that very succinctly, right? Very quickly. It'd be a no-brainer. But the truth is, most of us still have kind of a fog. We may be told to be a man, but what does that mean? I remember when I was a young dad, two of my best friends were over at our house, and between us we had seven sons. At the time, they were little rug rats. So they were running around doing what little boys do, tearing up the house. And uh, one of the wives walked over to us three dads and just simply asked this question. How are you going to raise these boys to be real men? And there was just this quiet. <laughs> we all kind of stood there for a second. And then one of the dads said this. He said, I, well, I, I guess we need to know what a real man is first, right? Let me tell you, that was a profound answer. Because you can't not raise a son to be a man if you're not clear what a real man is. I remember a short time after that, a young man came up to me, a 20-something guy, he's all frustrated. His girlfriend had broken up with him. She had said to him, you need to grow up and be a man. Can you imagine that? Somebody would say that to a 20-something-year-old guy. <laughs> but he came to me real frustrated, and he says, tell me, what is a man? Does anybody know? Can you give me a succinct definition of that? And again, here's the issue. For young men, you can't become what you can't define. You just wander around. You guess at it. 
And having guessed at it myself as a 20-something, we mostly guess wrong. You know, Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, the people run wild. They run wild. But you can apply that to one half of the population and say it this way, without a masculine vision, men run wild. They get confused. They run into dead ends. They make mistakes. They become troublesome. And I really think our side of the gender scale really weighs problematic much more so than the other. In fact, if you look today, most social problems are men problems. So what is a man? Do we just make up the answer? What is a man? Do we look for the media or Hollywood to come up with an answer? Did John Wayne have the answer in the previous generation? Or does little Wayne have the answer for this generation? <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's got the answer? You know, I think Alex Haley really had the best approach to finding the answer. You remember Alex Haley. He was the uh, African-American who decided he didn't really know much about his heritage, the African side. So he went to Africa, did painstaking research, and then out of that research wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book that became a television series, Roots. Okay? That's how he found out about his ancestry. For us who are believers, Christians who believe the Bible, our roots are the book of Genesis. So we go back to our roots when we have fundamental questions about manhood, womanhood, marriage, all those things that I'm sure Garrett will be addressing in the future. But when we go to the book of Genesis, we get to research man and find out what God intended from the beginning that he was supposed to be. So how does Genesis 1 and 2 describe a man? You know, honestly, if you take that question and go to it, it provides a fairly simple and straightforward answer. Because as you read through that, Adam, the first man, is given four responsibilities to mark out his manhood. And I don't think those four responsibilities passed away with Adam. I think those responsibilities are still in play for every man in this room. So what are they? Here's the first. Again, they're simple. Here's the first. A real man obeys God's word. Foundational to manhood is listening to life's head coach. Otherwise, you don't man up. If you don't listen to the, high, high, the coach, then what you do is you get stuck in no man's land. And that's where a lot of guys are. Genesis says it this way. Then the Lord God commanded the first man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat, lest you die. Now, what finally becomes clear to a real man is the Word of God is never restrictive. The Word of God is freeing. Most young men think everything but the Word of God is freeing. But notice to the very first man, here God is saying, listen, run and enjoy. Play here. Make choices. Go to any corner of this garden you want and just relish the adventure. Just don't do one thing. So God's Word was not restrictive to Adam. God's word was actually freedom for, for Adam and adventuresome for Adam. And when a real man really understands that, the word of God doesn't become a have to. It becomes something that he wants to do, to engage because of what it will open up for his life. Real man obeys God's word. Secondly, a real man loves and protects God's woman. Genesis 2, says it this way. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man, and the man said, wow. <laughs> Actually, that's my interpretation of the next verse. <laughs> a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That gets a little cryptic in the Hebrew, but, but any commentator or scholar will tell you, Adam's emoting here. He's excited. God brings this woman. He's been, he's been watching these animals, and they're all paired up, and so his expectation is growing for his pair. And so finally the woman's brought to him and he immediately falls in love. But, but, but there's a unique insight here. He gives the woman immediately what every woman since that time wants from a man. He immediately gives this woman his heart. You see that? He opens his heart and he goes, Wow, this is what I've wanted. You're wonderful. At last, you, apart from all these dumb animals, I finally get you. Look at you, all undressed. It's you, and you're perfect. 
And he's excited about that. Because let me tell you, that's what a woman wants. A woman wants a man's heart. In addition to that, Adam was charged with keeping Eve safe and protected. Now, this is not in these two verses. This is in the whole chapter of chapter 2. But there's a sequence that plays out here that helps us understand that. And it's this. First, Adam is created before Eve. Then Adam is given instruction, commands about the garden and how to live there before Eve. Then Eve is created and brought to the man as a gift, this treasure. And the natural thing when you're given this incredible gift, besides loving that gift, is to do what? Protect that gift. And so he is charged just by the story to watch out for her, which, of course, <laughs> he tragically failed to do, right? He left that part out, and Eve took the forbidden fruit, but, but the accent of what his responsibility was is, is in that transgression. Eve is not charged with the sin. Adam is charged with the transgression because he failed to protect his woman. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul would come on the scene and give instruction to husbands about how to love their wives. And as he does that, he draws upon these principles. And he tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now we can dig just a little deeper into that for just a second. Because how did Christ love the church? By meeting the church's deepest needs. So how should a man love a woman? By meeting her deepest needs. And what are the deepest needs of a woman? All research, social research today tells us the same thing. She wants to be emotionally engaged with her husband. She wants to connect. She wants to feel love. She wants to see his heart and experience his heart. And Paul is basically saying the same thing to men. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Meet her deepest needs. But then he goes on to say one other thing. He says, and protect her from mistakes and sin. Keep her safe and secure by protecting her with God's word. There it is again. The same two things. Real manhood stuff for real men. Because real men will love and protect the woman that God brings into his life. The third mark is this. Embrace God's work. Embrace God's work. Genesis 2.15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. Now this is before the fall. And suddenly, right here at the beginning, work is not just work. Work is seen as something sacred in response to God and his positioning of every man into places of employment. And if a man sees it that way, he approaches his work rightly as a way of glorifying and serving God. Just like Paul will pick up on in Colossians 3 when he says, whatever you do, do to serve the Lord Christ. That's why we use the term, by the way, for a job for us Christians as not just a job, but as a vocation. Because vocation comes from the word voice, voice of God, vocal. A job is really a calling of God to serve and to glorify Him. I remember when my wife and I, years ago, were, we were in Paris, France. We were at the Louvre. And during our time of just touring the Louvre, the guide we were with said, hey, we've opened up something new underneath the Louvre. It's the original foundations upon which the Louvre was built, the original fortress. Would you like to go down? So we went down, and there down in the bowels of the Louvre were these foundation stones that had been uncovered. Even when the fortress was built, they were covered, those foundation stones were covered up. But what our guide pointed out to us was, look at these stones. Look how perfectly every stone by the stonemason is cut. How perfectly every stone fits with another stone so that there's no space. It is an incredible foundation. And then she said, look a little closer. You'll notice that every stone has a cross carved into it. She said, you know why? Because these stonemasons weren't building a fortress. They were building a temple for the glory of God. That's how they saw their work. Real men engage work as God's work, wherever they are. And then lastly, real men better God's world. 
Genesis 1.28 says how. It says, And God blessed the man and the woman and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So here in this passage, men as well as women better God's world by doing two things. It's just right there in front of us. First, for the man, it's by raising and launching healthy next generation children. That's how he betters the world. That's one of the primary ways he changes the next generation. He shoots an arrow that he won't see land into the next generation to make an impact on the next generation that he'll never see, like Poppy did just even in mentoring me. That's what real men do. And then they subdue the earth by using their gifts over and above their job to in some way better their community. It might be through sharing Christ with a friend. It might be taking a mission trip somewhere and working with a people group in another place of the world. It might be just mentoring at work a younger man in how to get his life more properly positioned so that life will bear great fruit rather than barrenness. That's what real men do. Real manhood is about bettering God's world. So, when I talk to men all over the world, I just give them this short definition. So what is a man? Let's just summarize what a man is. If I were talking, it wouldn't be in generalities of just saying man up with emptiness on the other side of that. Or just go show yourself a man, but I can't tell him what that really means. What I would say to him is, if you want to be a real man, here are the original blueprints given by God himself. Obey God's word. Love and protect God's woman. Engage God's work. And better God's world. That's a man. Now, I tell you all that to really get to where, where I want to take you. <laughs> and that's the implications of that simple definition. Okay? Because I think they're important. And I hope that you'll be able to leave today and even use some of these. But here are just some things that would be implications, practical implications. First, this is a manhood every man can aspire to. Some forms of manhood our world puts out there on certain athletic achievements or power or whatever, it leaves out a lot of guys. But this is a manhood every man can aspire to. It's simple, it's clear, it's practical, it's direct. I mean, even a boy in the congregation today can go home and practice these things. Just like my boys when they were growing up, one of the things as their dad that I did is I would come alongside them and say, hey, listen, it's mom's birthday. But listen, Garrett, listen, Mason, don't just send them a, get them a card. Get a card and write your mom the things that you admire in her, why you love her. Touch her heart. See where I'm coming from? Or one day I'd grab Mason and say, hey, why don't you put a little sticky note on mom's steering wheel today with a smiley face and just tell her how much you love her and that she's special to you. Or thank, thank her for what she did in that science project that helped you pass it. Okay? But do you see what I'm doing? I'm teaching them manhood. And it can go all the way through the rest of life. This is a manhood every man can aspire to. Second, this is a manhood that can serve as one's life compass. And I only tell you that because that's how it's done for me. I mean, after I was a Christian, this kind of became my life compass. And at any point in time, when maybe I'm discouraged or I'm just confused, I can just scroll up. Okay, Robert, are you being the man God wants you to be? Is the issue about God's word? Or is it about your wife? Is it, is it about work? Or is it about your children? Where, where is that that you need to, to kind of make some course corrections? Because you can, you can ask yourself, how am I doing in those four areas? And by the way, there are four areas. Most young guys only go for one area in their 20s and 30s. And what is that? Work. Work. They want to be successful at work. And so they go after it, and that part may bloom and get green and rich and prosperous, while the others, you know, are taken lightly or may even wither. And I always tell young guys, I can't tell you how many successful businessmen have been in my office who will tell me at 50, I so regret that I work too much. I so regret that I didn't spend more time with my son, who's now in therapy. I'm so upset the fact that I lost my wife when I was 30 when I was doing so well in the workplace. And you know why? Because he was living out a one-dimensional real manhood. He was engaging work, but he wasn't keeping it in balance to the other three. Because at the end of life, when you report back to the Creator, He's not going to ask you on one job description point. 
He's going to ask you about all four. And by the way, when you get my age, if those four are imbalanced, it creates a satisfying manhood from the past. You let, you know, I made those decisions and at times I didn't take that promotion because I knew it would take more time away from my family. But even though I lost maybe an extra income, where I am now looking back, I am so glad I did that. Because real manhood is all four, not just one. Third, this is a manhood that women long for. Because what women long for is a man who will deeply love them and be skilled in how to love them from the heart, which we saw briefly Adam do, but also a man who will keep them safe and secure because that's his responsibility as well, which Adam failed miserably in. But this is the kind of manhood that women want, and a real man does both. Fourth, this is a manhood dads can confidently call their sons to. Instead of just saying to them, be a man, they can actually sit down and tell their sons what a man is. One of the things when I wrote the book Modern Day Night that uh, Garrett mentioned was we started raising our sons with this definition in mind. So when they turned 13, we had kind of a little ceremony where we would go out and we would talk to each son, my boys for instance, and we would tell them what the definition of manhood was all about and then we would tell them, we want you to memorize this tonight because we're going to talk about this for the rest of your life. And I'm going to hold you accountable to this. But I'm also going to let you hold your dad accountable to it as well. This is a journey we're going to do together. And so as issues came up in their teenage years about girls and later about college and making good grades or when they were first in the workplace or they would have conflicts with different friends and stuff or they would think about how they were going to make a contribution to the world, the definition always comes into the language. And we talk about what real manhood is all about. Today, my sons, like myself, wear a gold ring opposite our wedding ring. And on the gold ring is our manhood crest with those four things symbolized in this ring so that we can remind ourselves, just like we do about being married, that God is calling us not just to participate in a world and be successful, but God has called us to be significant in the world, and that can only be defined by God, not by the world. Fifth, this is a manhood that history affirms. The other day I was reading, I put this in because the other day I was reading the Wall Street Journal and Bill Bennett, the former Secretary of Education, just making some comments about manhood through the centuries and through the cultures, and he, he made the comment that manhood, if you really were to look from a broad historical perspective, always goes back to men being successful in four domains, and I'm going to quote him here. He says, history has repeatedly described manhood in terms of success in four domains, and then he lists them, religion, family, work, and community. Does that ring a bell? It's the same thing that history is reaffirming what Genesis set forth from the very beginning when God brought man out of the dust of the ground and says, I want to make you a real man. So let me tell you how you can be that. Six, this is a manhood that promises reward. If you look in the Genesis story, you get glimpses of that reward. For instance, in obeying God's word, you see the word freedom used. You're free to go anywhere in the garden. Later, Jesus would say the same thing on a much broader scale. He says, you shall know the truth about life, and the truth will set you free. A real man understands that, but that's the reward is freedom. For marriage or loving and protecting God's woman, Genesis says you'll have deep, intimate companionship described in that phrase, one flesh. If you want that one flesh, you'll be my man. Third, on engaging God's work, there's significance because Paul says, if you work heartily as unto the Lord, he says in Colossians 3, there is reward for you. Trust it. It's out there for you. And then lastly, promising a better world, especially the reward for promising uh, being involved in a better world, especially with your children, the reward is joy. Third John says, I have no greater joy than this than to see my children walking in the truth. And for some of us who are a little further along in life, <clears throat> after the seduction of the next career move or 
other things in the world as far as recreations and stuff, but we did invest in our sons and daughters, and now we see them bloom into adulthood themselves well. Let me tell you, we would all be up here saying the same thing. There's no greater joy than that than to see your children walking in the truth. Real manhood is not just responsibility. Real manhood comes with the promise of reward. And then lastly, I want to say this. This is a, this is a manhood that delivers what it promises. It's not just an empty promise. And if I could just finish with just a brief testimony. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a, a family that was significantly troubled. Let me just say that with my mom and dad. There was constant conflict. In fact, I was drafted in a lot of times as a 10-year-old, 12-year-old to manage that conflict, which was unnatural. My dad was distant emotionally. He was a chronic alcoholic, which made it so troublesome. When I left Ruston, I was never so glad to get out of town. <laughs> you know, but when I left town, I left town clueless about life with a lot of bad behaviors. And that finally changed in college when I came to Christ, when Jesus finally entered my life and I locked on to God's Word and then later, through good discipleship, I locked on to what I'm sharing with you today, a very practical, simple, but clear and specific definition of manhood and I made it my North Star. So I began to pursue it as a young man. Now I stand before you 47 years later and here's the question as I finish. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Not doing this, choosing this in order to stay true to that North Star, correcting here in order to stay true to that North Star. Was it worth it? Well, if seeing how God's Word has rebuilt parts of your life in a way that now they really work and you have felt His blessing and sometimes His prosperity over the years, yes, it's been worth it. If experiencing 42 years of really good marriage with a woman who is now my best friend, my very best friend, instead of repeating what my parents had or worse, is worth it. If having four kids who are now as adults are healthy, loving, employed, <laughs> but most importantly, Christ followers, real Christ followers, who spontaneously at our house or their house or when we're playing golf together enter a conversation spiritually, and start talking about how God's Word did or how they reached this person for Christ, yeah, it was worth it. It was very much worth it. If having two sons who still like hanging out with their old man and having fun, yeah, it was worth it. If having little regret in life because God kept me from a lot of unnecessary dead ends that I would have chosen, yes, it was worth it. If seeing God use me at work, give me a bigger vision of work, Help me engage people in ways that I never thought I could, like writing a book. My English teacher would roll over in her grave if she knew I wrote a book. <laughs> but then it actually went on to help people. <laughs> yeah, it was worth it. And one day, meeting Poppy in heaven, one of the former pastors of this church, meeting him in heaven and telling him that his advice about the Bible was spot on, that will be priceless. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to just share your word here today. Thank you for the, the honor of standing in this pulpit and for the people of First Presbyterian Church who obviously are alive in you. May your blessing be on them. And Lord, may Baton Rouge in many ways be impacted by this church in everyday ways because what people notice emanating from this church is that real men come out of here. And women love it. And children love it. Employers love it. And the community loves it. Let this be a real man place. In Jesus' name, amen.